Okay, round two. Can you hear me now? I feel like I'm in one of those old like cell phone commercials. Can you hear me now? Yay, Sandra and Elena are here. Yay. Okay, ooh, and Ariana's here. I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, I think you all know me, but for those who watch this video later, my name is Jessica Nadzem. And I'm an AP bio teacher. This is my fifth year teaching it. So I kind of like to think I kind of know what I'm talking about some days. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you all about natural selection and evolution, which is one of my favorite topics. So whoop whoop, glad y'all are here. Um, I hope you guys are all having a fabulous Wednesday. Can you believe it's already Wednesday? Which is awesome because I don't know about y'all, but my spring break is in two weeks and I really need a spring break. So, yeah, I hope you guys have one very, very soon as well. So today, dun, 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 we're going to talk about microevolution. It's going to be great. So you can tell I've had a lot of caffeine again, as I do every week, and therefore I am singing things at you. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> okay. So, like I said, we're doing microevolution. I've had my 90 seconds of talking randomly at you and waiting for any last minute stragglers to come in. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. This doesn't have my name on it because I forgot to do that today. Oops, it's okay. I already said my name. I'm Jessica Nadzem and I teach biology. I've already told you that. Um, just in case you're not already using it, look at all the things we have. We have math and English and social science and more science and history and it's all great. So you should definitely check it out if you need some, any support in your AP classes. Um, all the streams are taught by certified teachers or highly per high performing students who have already completed the course. So if you need some extra homework help and you don't wanna spend any money because everything is free, you should definitely come see us and like every day of the week. Cause I'm gonna be honest with you, I tell my kids that this counts as studying because I always run into that. They're like, well, I studied for your test. And I'm like, how did you study for my test? And they say, I read the book. And I'm like, reading is very, very good. Yes, it's good for your brain. Studying is more than reading. I consider this to be studying though, especially if you're taking some notes, maybe in like colors and stuff, because science says that colors make your brain remember things. Um, and if you're like me, it's just pretty and helps distract you from the fact that you've been studying for four hours. That's why all of my notes are in like 12,000 different colors. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna move on now because I think you've all had a chance to look at the schedule. Now let's talk about, oh, I have to plug for us because you know, all our stuff is free now. Did I mention that earlier? Everything is free, everything, everything, everything. Um, and therefore I'd really like to encourage you to check out our Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube channels where we're gonna have even more tips, information, opportunities, all our things, so check it out. Um, we're very active on social media because we are millennials. We invented social media basically. All right. Let's get into it. What are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to talk about natural selection. We're also going to talk about artificial selection. You're going to see the difference between those two today. We're also going to talk about microevolution and population genetics. So we're really going to be looking at how populations change over time. And when we get into that, then we're going to do some math. Math, 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 math. And if you're like me, you never bring your school calculator home. So all you ever have is your handy dandy iPhone or Samsung calculator, which great for y'all. I mean, I tell my kids, like, that's legit all you need. Technically, I think you can do pretty much everything on the AP test without a calculator, which is really nice. Um, I know you can on the ACT. Most of the AP test would take you a while, though. So there's that. All right. So that's what we're going to do. Dun, 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 dun. Let's look at things. All right. I'd love to start natural selection by telling my students a story. It may be March, but it's never too late or early, depending on how you look at it, to talk about Christmas. Um, I celebrate Christmas. I believe it's a wonderful holiday. Um, but regardless of whether or not if you celebrate it, I believe if you live in the United States, you've probably been exposed to the folk tale of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. He was a reindeer, but he had red nose. And if you've seen any variety of Santa themed Christmas movies, you've probably noticed reindeer are kind of pretentious. Like if the weather's bad, they don't want to fly the sleigh. And uh, if you look different, they won't let you play any reindeer games with them and they'll laugh at you and call you names. Rudolph had a mutation. His mutation 
was his red nose, which I like to think that humans are culturally evolved enough that if someone was born with a red nose, we'd just be like, that's super cool. You're going to be TikTok famous. Reindeer apparently are not that culturally evolved. So they made fun of him, shunned him, wouldn't let him play any reindeer games. We've hopefully seen the movies or are familiar with how this goes. So at the time, at the beginning of Rudolph's life, this was a very negative mutation. And it actually would have selected against him. And he probably would not have been considered very fit because he wouldn't have survived, at least not with the rest of the herd. And he probably wouldn't have reproduced considering the rest of the herd shunned him. But then... If you know the song, there was a foggy night. And on that foggy night, all the other reindeer were like, we can't see. And so guess who could see on that foggy night? Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And as a result, he got to pull the sleigh. Now here's the part that I talk to my kids about and make sure we use very specific biology language. When Rudolph returned home to the North Pole after his hero mission, how do you think he was received by his fellow reindeer? Just out of curiosity. How do y'all think people responded to Rudolph when he got back? And by people, I mean reindeer. Were they nice to him when he got back? Were they mean to him still? What did they do? They were nice. Very good, Sandra. Um, if you have just saved Christmas, I would hope that your village would be nice to you when you got back to it. So when Rudolph got back after this mission, chances are the reindeer changed their tune and all of a sudden they were like, OMG, you saved Christmas, woo. His fitness probably went up because remember, fitness is about surviving. He survived a foggy night pulling the sleigh and it's about reproducing. I have a feeling that all of the lady reindeer were probably very impressed with Rudolph, given that he was at the front of the sleigh, in charge. And as a result, he probably had some baby reindeers. And what do you think those baby reindeers had? What did they have? What would Rudolph's baby reindeer have? Red noses. Very good, Sandra. Rudolph's red nose was naturally selected for because it was considered a positive thing that helped him survive and helped him reproduce. And over time, you can see over here, I've got all of these red reindeer because over time, think about it, they're going to be like, oh, OMG, are you related to Rudolph? And then you're going to be really popular. And then they're probably going to produce more reindeer with red noses and so on and so on until eventually having a black nose is like, eh, whatever. So, Rudolph is a definition of natural selection because he shows when it's positive for your environment, you will pass that on to your offspring and over time, the whole population can change. That was a long metaphor, but does anyone have any questions about it? What do we think? Now you're all like, why is this lady talking about Christmas in March after she talked about spring break? I'm gonna give y'all five, four, three, two, one. All right, I'm gonna quit talking about reindeers and I'm gonna talk about other stuff. I'm gonna talk about the myths of evolution. Now, continuing to talk about cartoons, <laughs> um, if you were like me, you probably grew up watching cartoons. Did you guys have Pokemon or X-Men by any chance? Or Pokemon, however you say it? We grew up saying Pokemon. Did y'all have any of those like superheroes or Pokemon or there was like Digimon when I was a kid? Did y'all watch any of those? Tell me, tell me guys, I need to know things. I know there's only four, that just means you get to talk more. Jess says no, oh man, I'm sorry. It's never too late to catch up, especially since we have the internet and you can find every episode. So the reason I ask about Pokemon and X-Men, they always talk about evolution in these shows. They'll be like, oh, this girl, she evolved and now she can like shoot fire out of her eyes. Or, oh, we've got this caterpillar thing, but it evolved into a butterfly. That's not evolution. Let me be very, 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 very clear here. That's not evolution. Once you're born, your DNA doesn't change. And if it does, it doesn't do it all over your body to give you superpowers. 
which is annoying if you're like me and you really just want to teleport from your bed to your fridge <laughs> to your couch, which is what I wish I could do every day, but instead I have to walk there. You can't evolve once you're born. Evolution is a process that happens over the period of reproduction. Um, it occurs in gametes. It is the result of mutation, but it can't be a mutation that happens after you're already born, once your genome is constructed. It doesn't happen that way. The other myth of evolution is this thing, which I bet we've all seen this somewhere in a biology textbook. It's where you like see a monkey that turns into a taller monkey and then into a man and this and that. Sorry, not a monkey, a gorilla, an ape. That is not an accurate representation of evolution. Um, when I've taught in certain schools, so full disclosure, I teach in the Bible Belt, and there's a lot of creationism and this and that. Um, I'm here to teach you the AP curriculum. So I will be sticking to AP curriculum. AP curriculum states that evolution and natural selections are full blown theories. They have been scientifically tested. There's evidence for them. That being said, unfortunately, a lot of people see this image of a gorilla slowly transitioning into a man and think, my grandpa was a gorilla, that can't be true. It's because it's not true. Your ancestors were not gorillas. You share common DNA and have a common ancestor, but you are not like part gorilla necessarily. It's the best way I can say that. Um, people share a common ancestor with primates, um, but we also share a common ancestor with bananas. So we'll get to that all later. That's in the next coming weeks. But I just wanted to point that out because people always see this and they're like, oh, so that's what happens every 20,000 years, it just evolves. No, that's not how it happens. And we will get into how that happens. Does anyone have any general questions about evolution and natural selection um, or about these topics? Four, three, two, one. All right, y'all, I'm gonna keep going. Do, do, do. So, like I said, it's not how it works. Not, 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 eh. Those are not the things that happen. Now we're gonna actually talk about the things that do happen. Okay, so you may have seen this thing up above my head, uh, Survival of the Fittest. And it's used kind of as a joke, but it's pretty much true. The fitter organism, or the fitter variety is going to survive in natural selection. So the idea in natural selection is you have phenotypes, you have features. So whether it's dark hair, light hair, whatever, um, eye color, height, all these different phenotypes, these tangible observable features, there will be some that will make you more fit. And that means you are better at surviving and better at reproducing. In this case, who is the person in this one on the left who is the person who is better at surviving in this grocery store? Who is better at surviving in that grocery store? The guy, why is he better at surviving, quote unquote, Sandra? He's tall! All of us who are not tall are like, this is so unfair, and it is, and that's a discussion for later. Um, but I mean, you can look at the exact same thing over here on the right, where I'm looking at giraffes. They don't have grocery stores, they have trees. And these giraffes, oh, hang on, my dog just walked in the room, sorry. Okay, um, but these giraffes, who is gonna be the fitter giraffe, the tall one or the short one? Who's gonna be the fitter giraffe? The tall one. Why is the tall one considered more fit? He can reach the leaves, exactly, Jess, okay? So, I mean, you can have a short giraffe and maybe it can reach the leaves, but it won't be able to reach as many leaves as the tall one. And so over time, the tall giraffe is gonna get more leaves. That means he gets more food. That means he gets bigger, which means he probably has an easier time reproducing because he has resources and he can fight off all the other giraffes. Plus the lady giraffes are like, he's tall, swoon. Therefore, he's considered fitter. He's better at surviving, he's better at reproducing. That giraffe is gonna win the race. 
not saying that people who are short are not going to win the race. It depends on your environment, which is the next point I want to make. Yes, being less tall in a grocery store is extremely inconvenient, but humans are different. We have massively evolved intelligence compared to other organisms. So basically what that means is we've learned to use tools, we've learned to adapt, and we learn to do it very, very, very quickly in most circumstances. So yeah, that girl may not be as tall, but she's got other adaptations, I would guess, that are gonna make her just as smart or better, if not smarter and better. So the other example I'm looking at here is we've got these mice. And we've got two or three dark mice and we've got a bunch of white mice. And then we have these owls. These owls have lousy eyesight. They're like, I see nothing. That's why owls hunt at night. They can't see, it doesn't matter. Um, but so over time, as the owls are hunting, is an owl more likely to find a dark mouse or a light mouse? Which one is the owl gonna find? Dark mouse or light mouse? The light mouse, yeah, because you can see it. It's gonna reflect off of light or any moonlight, anything like that. And dark mice are gonna be a lot harder to see in the dark. So over time, all the white mouse get eaten. All that's left is dark mice. That dark mouse is fitter. It is more likely to survive. It is more likely to reproduce, more likely to produce dark mouse offspring. And so over time, the mouse mice get darker. That's it. It's all about who's going to be better at surviving and reproducing at the end of the day. Anytime you see these sorts of questions on the AP exam and they mention the term fit, F-I-T, you better talk about surviving and reproducing because those are the words they want to hear. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about this intro to natural selection? Three, two, one. Okay, I'm gonna go. So, you've probably heard of this dude. His name is Darwin, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is the guy who came up with natural selection. You've probably already heard his bio because biology teachers love to talk about this guy because he like did a lot of cool stuff. And if they're like me, and they like camping and traveling, we really just wanna live vicariously through him because what this dude did was he got on a boat for like four years, sailed all around the world for four years, and everywhere he went, he just collected random specimens like birds, fish, animals, plants, everything. He was a little bit of a hoarder, to be perfectly honest. If he wasn't a scientist, he definitely would have been on Storage Wars for having way too much stuff in his closet. But because he's a biologist, it's considered perfectly acceptable to have lots of random stuff. But it was a good thing he got all that random stuff because once he got back to England, where he was from, he took all the stuff and he organized it. So like, yeah, he was a little bit of a hoarder, but it was organized hoarding, so that was better. So he took all his stuff, put it out and figured out, hey, these things are the same. They just have these tiny minute differences. And when he had cataloged everything, not only had he cataloged what it was, he cataloged where he got it from. So for example, he would have these birds. You might've heard of Darwin's finches. And Darwin's finches, he would notice, he was like, these are all the exact same bird. The only difference is the beaks. Their beaks are different. And he was like, well, they're all somewhere in these islands, very, very close together, very reasonable for these birds to fly between the islands. But why would they change their beaks? Has anyone already learned this? Why do these finches change their beaks? What is the advantage of a big beak over a little beak? Hmm, different food. Very good, Elena. So birds with big beaks were able to eat big seeds. They could crush them with their big beaks. Birds with teeny tiny pointy beaks couldn't necessarily crush them, but they could peck them until they opened and they could get what they needed. So these birds lived in the Galapagos, which is a series of islands, but they have remarkably, remarkably different ecology, meaning their environments are very different. So even though the birds all came from one location, as they branched out, over time they naturally selected for whatever characteristic was best to help their survival. So maybe if one bird went to an island that had like a bunch of giant nuts to eat, it would slowly over time be more beneficial to have the big beak. If it went to another island and there weren't any nuts, there were just worms. That one would get a long skinny beak with a pointy end so he could be like, snatch worms. 
it was what was best to make them survive because that's the only way to survive. Otherwise they wouldn't have made it. Now this all comes back to environment though. So like I was saying, those birds, their mutations, it's not like the environment was on them and was like, oh, ha ha ha, you must change to this type of beak. No, birds don't just randomly sit there and think, oh, this is the only food, gotta change my beak. Remember, evolution only happens before you're born. It's a change in, de in genes, it's a mutation. If you remember from last unit, mutations are completely random. Natural selection is not, it is completely dependent on your environment, but mutations are random. So you can get a mutation that gets you a like big beak. But the chances of that happening when you need it to are kind of slim. We see another example of this in these moths. So if you look really, really closely, because sometimes they're hiding because they're camouflaged. We have these moths, moths. I keep mispronouncing it, I'm sorry. So these moths, you can see we've got some white moths and some dark moths. So the reason I talk about moths is because the AP Biotest loves to talk about these moths. And the reason is they are a very good example of evolution that you can witness within a few generations, like human generations, so like 50 to 100 years. Most of the time evolution happens so slowly you need thousands of years to witness it, but bugs don't live very long. And as a result, their generations are very short and very fast. And so you can observe their changes very, very quickly. So for example, these moths, for the most part, lived on birch trees, which birch trees are a lot lighter. They're more of a like gray, ashy color bark. And to camouflage the moths would be that same white gray color. But then there was this thing called the Industrial Revolution. What happened during the Industrial Revolution? AP history peeps, what happened? Hmm. What happened in the Industrial Revolution? Hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pollution, very good, Elena. So the Industrial Revolution, while it was great for mass producing things that humans wanted, um, it was not so great for the environment because all of a sudden you had these massive factories burning massive fires that put a lot of smog into the air. That smog was so bad, it coated these white trees in ash and the trees turned black. But the moths were still white. <laughs> And so if you got these birds, these hungry, hungry birds, the birds would be like, yay, food, easy to see, plop, plop, and they ate them all. They ate them so much over time, all that was left was the darker moths, which used to be the ones that didn't survive very well. And so over time, the population shifted and all the moths got dark. So it all depends on the environment you're in. That color or that phenotype, it doesn't matter what it is. It only matters on where you live. I always tell my kids, I could grow fins right now. Just, well, not right now. I guess I could give birth to offspring with fins because remember, it has to happen before they're born. But if I had a kid with fins, I mean, he'd be TikTok famous, I guess, but like it wouldn't really be necessarily beneficial unless the planet flooded or something and he needed to swim everywhere or he was going to the Olympics for swimming. It's only beneficial if it's in a certain circumstance. If he was growing up in like the desert, that would be useless. <laughs> Another example of the environmental impact. So I've got plants here in the rainforest and plants in the desert. Plants in the rainforest and plants in the de desert are highly adapted to their environments. Desert plants are usually gonna be very thin and tapered because they don't need to store as much water because it rains all the time. Um, whereas desert plants are usually gonna be very thick and bulbous, um, kind of like, I don't know if y'all can see behind me, my cactus, because those desert plants are storing water. So they have mutations that have changed their structures um, plants in the desert, trees are also going to be very woody and hard because they are trying to keep all that water inside their trunk. Whereas plants in the rainforest may be a little more like bendy necessarily, just because they can afford to lose a little bit more water through transpiration. So they're going to do different things depending on the environment that they're in. However, sometimes environment doesn't matter because humans like to mess with things. Like I said, humans are extremely smart, which is like, great, I love being semi-smart. Um, but we change things sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. I'm gonna talk about the good ones today. So we've got a um, meme from Clueless because you need a meme from Clueless. Um, not prude, I'm highly selective. So I think of it this way. If I was to go to a shelter and get a new dog or buy a new purebred dog, whatever, which I wouldn't because my current dog who is sitting on my feet would kill me. Um, 
I would be highly selective. I know I would want a young one so I could train it. I know I would want one that's like a good size that I can still hold on to them, but not like so small. If I stepped on them, I'd be scared they died or something. Um, I would want to make sure they were smart enough to learn tricks, yet not too smart that they're smarter than me. Like I would be very selective. And people are very selective about their dogs. So I love this meme. I saw it on Facebook the other day. Um, it's this wolf. He's like, I see humans at a campfire. It's cold and I'm starving. Maybe I should ask for scraps. What is the worst thing that can happen? 10,000 years later, we have a pug. Yeah, that's artificial selection. So over time, humans, yeah, 10,000 years ago, we got some wolves and we we're like, these are great. They'll help us hunt. They'll defend us. They'll be man's best friend. It's going to be great. But I mean, if I lived 10,000 years ago, while I would want someone to hunt with and be my best friend, I would want my best friend to be maybe a little more fluffy and like a lap dog. So I would find a wolf puppy that was maybe not as aggressive and a little more fluffy. And I would only breed it with other wolves that were fluffy and not aggressive. And over time, you get all those traits that you actually want. Another really good example that we talk about in biology for artificial selection is gonna be the evolution of the mustard plant. So the mustard plant is an ancient plant. Um, but it was bred for certain features, whether it was terminal buds, lateral buds, stem, leaves, stem and flowers, flower clusters. And over time, overbreeding for those specific features gave rise to all these different vegetables. Cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, I think that's how you say it, kale, broccoli, cauliflower. All of these are from a single plant. And hopefully you eat them because vegetables are good for you. Um, but humans did that because someone said, ooh, I really like on the mustard plant how it's got great flower clusters. I'm just going to breed the mustard plants with the best flower clusters. And over time, you get a cauliflower. I mean, it took like a couple of million thousand years or whatever. I don't know how long it took. I know it took a while. But they did it because they would not breed with anything that was considered undesirable. They were highly selective. Same with dogs. I mean, if you've ever seen... Um, I'm trying to think of a super specific dog breed. Um, a pug. They have to be super specific to get those characteristics. A little curly tail, a flat face, that round little body. Like, you couldn't breed that with a big dog. It, one, it wouldn't work. Two, you wouldn't get those features that you want. That's artificial selection. Does anyone have any questions on artificial selection? Anyone at all? Think, think, think. Three, two, one. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go on. So let's talk about convergent evolution. So convergent evolution is pretty cool. So this will be, and I think this is kind of where the argument that, oh, people are descended from apes came from. So people will assume that, not people in general, but like when they are opposing an evolutionary theory or trying to disprove it, um, the assumption is that, oh, well, we have so many features like apes. Um, so, for example, have any of you ever seen the movie Tarzan? Like the animated version came out in like the 90s. Hopefully you all have Disney Plus and have seen it by now. Have you seen Tarzan? Yes, Sandra's seen it. Air high five to you, Sandra. So if you've seen Tarzan, you know it's this little boy who gets raised by gorillas. And when he's a little kid, one of the gorillas is not very nice to him. And so he's like, oh, I don't belong. I'm not like you guys. But his mom, who's like the best mom ever and a gorilla, is like, we're exactly the same. Look, we both have hands. We both have faces. We both have ears. We have all these features are the same. So I think where people have gotten this mixed up is people think, oh, if we look exactly like something, we must be related to it. While that is true for some stuff, it's not true for everything. So for example, if you ever look at say an ichthyosaur, which is an ancient like dinosaur fish that would eat all of us, a dolphin and a shark, they look a lot alike. They're kind of gray, they got two fins, uh, they got a fin on top, uh, they got longer noses. Like if you look at them, you would think, wow, they're cousins, they must be related. But they're not related as closely as you think they are. So convergent evolution is where you have two different things, two different species, and over time they start to look similar. They're not the same, but they look and have a lot of the same structures of functions. So you can see that like 
these guys are descended from some unknown reptile ancestor and some unknown mammal ancestor. Like they didn't come from the same ancestor and branch off, they came from different things. But as they adapted to their environment, which is aquatic, they all developed the same features because those are the things that natural selection chooses for to survive in an aquatic environment. We also have an idea of divergent evolution. Divergent evolution is more of what people and apes did. There was some common ancestor to apes and humans, but the apes went one way and the humans said, nah, we're going this way. And they went their two separate ways. That's divergent evolution. If you ever saw those Shailene Woodley movies or read the books Divergent, that's all it is. Everyone is the same, but then they're like, no, I don't want to. And they go off in their separate ways. Any questions about convergent evolution? Anything, anything at all? Three, two, one. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this next one. So let's talk about population genetics. So when I was doing this, I was literally just trying to find memes and gifs of like baby animals all over the place because when I think of population, I think of like all the different stuff that there is, all of the like population explosions. Like I told y'all earlier, I live in the South um, and in the South, we have this massive overpopulation of deer and wild hogs, I found out. I was watching the news tonight and they were like, they have um, confirmed 700 wild hogs were hunted in the past two weeks or something. To which I was like, I've never seen a pig running around. Like, I don't get it. But apparently it happens and I am not an ecologist, so I do not question their decisions. You can have overpopulations of things. Um, never an overpopulation of otters because they're so cute. But um, if I walked out on my back porch and I saw this many raccoons there every single day, I would think that there was an overpopulation of raccoons. Um, in Arkansas, we also have usually a big overpopulation of deer if we don't keep that under control with hunting. And as a result, we have a pretty long hunting season where you can go and hunt deer. Um, but the idea here is that in these populations, these massive groups of organisms that are the same species living together, it's their changes, so let's say you've got a raccoon and um, the raccoon mutates. That's a random event. Maybe the raccoon grows wings. I don't know. Um, but it's random. It's not like the raccoon sits there and thinks, oh, I could get so much more food if I could fly. Let's grow some wings. No, it's not a sentient experience that they think about. It's, oops, your DNA messed up here. Some wings or a fourth toe, whatever it is. And sometimes that's beneficial and sometimes it's not. Like there are some things that can happen, like maybe growing some wings, maybe that's beneficial. Maybe it's a negative thing. Maybe all your hair falls out. Maybe it doesn't matter. Like cats, sometimes they have this condition called polydactyly. They'll be born with extra like finger paws, whatever. And it's completely like has no effect on them. They're fine. They just sit and do cat things like any other cat except they have extra paws, I guess. So that's all population genetics is talking about. The idea that this is a completely random event, it's not sentient. A cat can't just sit there and be like, man, I'd love to have an extra toe. It just happens. So when we talk about this, um, again, really wanna talk about if these mutations are gonna be positive, negative, or neutral. For example, when we talked about Rudolph a minute ago, Rudolph in the end had a very positive mutation by having that red nose. However, what if there had never been a foggy day? Would Rudolph's mutation ever have been beneficial if there had never been a foggy day? Would Rudolph's mutation of a red nose ever have been beneficial if there had not been a foggy day? So if the skies had always stayed clear. No, very good, Elena. It wouldn't have. Rudolph would have continued to be outcast. It would have been very sad, but it would have been a negative, considered a negative mutation. It would not have been naturally selected for. We would not someday have a grand population of red-nosed reindeer. It just wouldn't have happened. Now, there are other mutations that can happen that can be more positive. So, for example, this guy down here on the bottom left is called a cave fish. And believe it or not, he is almost identical to another fish that doesn't live in a cave, except this guy doesn't grow eyeballs. These fish have lived in caves for hundreds, if not thousands of millions of years. 
And they live in a cave where it's very, very dark, as in there is no light whatsoever. So there's no way for them to see. So one fish just mutated and didn't have eyeballs. Now all of the fish don't have eyeballs because it's naturally selected for a positive mutation because the fish doesn't need eyeballs. It's a waste of energy to build an eyeball. Ta-da. So you can have other types of mutations that can be positive or negative. Again, it depends on the environment. If this eyelessness had happened to that fish like in Florida, he would have been eaten by the barracuda from Finding Nemo with like that. Another one that's positive but could have been negative. We have these rats. I really wanted to find the one from Kim Possible because the real ones kind of freak me out. But I found this and it made me feel better. So naked mole rats are just that. They are rats that dig in the ground and they have no hair. If you're waiting for further explanation, there isn't one. That's all they are. They are rats that live in the desert with no hair. Um, and that's a mutation that must have arisen at some point, losing all their hair. For their circumstances, it's positive because they live underground. They don't need hair. It will be a waste of time for them to make it. Now, if they lived on the surface in like Siberia, they would probably need some hair. So it's all about the environment they're in, in terms of whether it's positive, negative, or neutral. Sickle cell. This is gonna be a negative one pretty much every time because you are not gonna be able to make a protein that you need. We're gonna talk more about sickle cell in a minute. So let's talk about genetic drift. So from here on out, we're talking about the populations. Yeah, you can have one random raccoon that grows wings or something, that's great. But I wanna talk about populations. I wanna talk about all the raccoons or all the otters or all the naked mole rats or all the humans, whatever it is. Let's talk about how they change. That's what this next section is gonna be about. So we have this idea of genetic drift and there are two forms of genetic drift. You can have a bottleneck or you can have what's called a founder effect. So the idea of genetic drift is that you change the allele frequency due to some chance event. So what I mean by that, let's say that you have a population of cats and a third of those cats have extra toes, which is a recessive condition. Cool, whatever. Um, if I randomly smited all the cats, which I never would, but if I did, how would we know that with that random one, I didn't accidentally get rid of all of the extra toed cats and then those would be left out of the population from then on. So this genetic drift is just gonna show how these move and how they respond to different circumstances. So the bottleneck, this is when the frequency is altered due to some population crash. So for some reason, um, so we've got like blue, white, and yellow marbles here. For some reason when we pour the marbles out, all that comes out are the blue ones, just due to random chance. Those are the only ones that survive. That's a bottleneck. Only certain ones got out of the exit, out of the bottleneck. Founder effect is gonna be this idea that um, whenever you have some mass migration, a bunch of them are gonna leave. So this is a silly one, but it's Dr. Seuss week, so it's actually kind of perfect. Did you guys ever see the Dr. Seuss movie about the Sneetches? They, they were yellow and they had stars on their bellies, the Sneetches. Has anyone heard of Sneetches? No, it's not looking good. No sneeches. So sneeches are these Dr. Seuss organisms. Um, and they were considered good if they had stars on their bellies. They were considered bad if they had stars on their bellies. But the moral of the whole book is eventually everyone has a star and no one cares. But in the book, they're also like, let's just leave. And so all the ones that don't have stars leave. And they go and start a whole new population where they're like, we don't need you and your criticism. That's a founder effect. A population leaves and founds some new place to live. Humans have done that before multiple times and we have extreme genetic diversity as a result of it. Um, one example of the founder effect you can see in people, um, in Amish communities, babies with Ellis Van Craven syndrome are born with six fingers. Because Amish communities are very isolated from the rest of the world, they go and sequester themselves. That's their thing. Um, there's not a lot of genetic diversity, and so there's a higher likelihood of that syndrome appearing. Sorry, all my contacts are kind of drying out. Okay, here we go. Final, well, before I move on, any questions about all this before I move into the math that we're going to do today? 
Any questions? Three, two, one. Okay, I'm gonna go on. Just to make my life a little easier, out of, there's three of you left. Elena, Sandra, Ariana, how many, which of you have talked about Hardy Weinberg before? Okay, Sandra's class has. Elena, Ariana, have your classes talked about it? Ariana's hasn't, okay. so. For the sake of the recording anyway, I'm gonna go pretty in depth um, and pretty much start from the beginning. Ariana, okay. So the way that I describe Artie Weinberg to my students is it's like a Punnett square, except it's for a population instead of two individuals and their chances of having offspring. So instead of saying, if a black cat and a white cat have baby cats, what percent of the offspring will be black cats? Instead, we're looking at, oh, if I have a bunch of feral cats, what percent of the population is heterozygous? Sometimes you need to know these things. Maybe you'll need to know it about cats, maybe you won't. I'm gonna show you after this an example of when you would definitely need to know if something is heterozygous. So, Hardy-Weinberg has two equations. You're gonna get these on your AP exam. They're gonna be in like the equations part and Honestly, my kids love it, even if they're not big on math, just because it's literally a giant puzzle game. Um, you've got these two equations, P and Q, and both equal one, and P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared, which equals one. These are two separate equations. Main thing you need to know is that the P is gonna talk about the dominance allele. So let's say I'm talking about black cats, that would be P. Um, Q is gonna be the recessive allele, so that would be like my white cat. This P and Q is the frequency of a dominant allele. So I want to remind you of, I'm going to make this bigger so you can see my thing. I'm going to try really hard to write this properly because I'm scared it might um, be backwards on your screen. Yeah, we'll see. So, hey, I did it. Okay, so P is going to refer to the dominant allele. can't write backwards. I can't do it. I can't do it. Q is going to refer to the recessive allele. So for example, you got a black cat and you got a white cat. So that dominant allele is going to refer to the black allele that makes the cat black. That recessive one is going to refer to the recessive allele that makes the cat not black. In this case, we'll say it's white. So I want to know if I've got like A hundred cats. So if I've got a hundred cats, how many alleles do those 100 cats have? How many alleles do those 100 cats have? 200, very good, Elena. So because they've each got one from mom, one from dad. So of those 200 alleles, how many of them are dominant? And how many of them are recessive? That's what I'm trying to figure out with that kind of formula. So I could say, but then I've got my, plus, plus, okay, did I do it? Ah, I did it. I can write backwards. So um, now we're going to talk about how this works in terms of when we're talking about genotypes. The big thing I tell my students is P plus Q is alleles. Just alleles, single letters. That's why it doesn't have a squared. Whenever I get into the P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared, that is going to be for genotype. So this um, P squared, well, P squared, sorry, I'm backwards today is always going to talk about the homozygous dominant. Whereas 2PQ is always going to be the heterozygous. And that Q squared is always going to be 
the homozygous recessive. All you have to do, AP gives you a number, and then you just plug them in. And you can use your calculator, whether not on your test, you can't use your phone, but you'll get a calculator and you just plug these numbers in. Sounds tricky, I promise you it's not. And I'm gonna give you an example in just a moment. So I'm gonna minimize this so you can see the slides again. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? We're gonna work an exact math example in a minute though. Tell me your questions, what do you need to know? Three, two, one, and we'll go to the next one. So Hardy Weinberg has these assumptions. That's what you can see over here on the right. Um, we only use this equation when there's random mating, that is, we're not like setting things up. So for example, in artificial selection to create Labradors, is are you gonna use random mating for that? Are you gonna use random mating between random dogs if you wanna create a Labrador? No, because you have no idea. If you end up with like a Chihuahua and an Irish Wolfhound, you are not gonna get a Labrador. It's not gonna happen. Hate to break it to you. So Hardy Weinberg assumes that the mating is random. The organisms aren't like set up. They do what they want. We assume there's a large population. We assume that there's no natural selection going on. We assume that there are no mutations and there is no migration. No one's moving in or out. And so you can see right here, I've actually got a Punnett square set up. Like I said, Hardy Weinberg is basically Punnett squares for whole populations. And so we're taking the P and the P, so these are, let's say these are dominant alleles, one from mom, one from dad, and we square it. Then we're taking the Q and the Q from mom and dad, and we got PQ, PQ, so that's where we get 2PQ from. And then we get Q and Q, and we get Q squared. So let's work an actual example of this. And so here's where this would be relevant. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this disorder, it's called sickle cell anemia. It's a, it has the potential to be an extremely debilitating disorder where your blood cells don't do what blood cells are supposed to do. Your blood cells are supposed to look like donuts. They have a little divot in them and everything. Um, but if your blood cells don't do that, then um, they may have sickle cell anemia, which is where instead they're like a half moon shape. And the problem with not being a donut is that blood cell doesn't carry oxygen very well. And because it's in that half moon shape, it's kind of pointy on the ends and that can actually poke and clump things. But the way it works, I'm gonna make this bigger again because I just realized y'all do need more than my face. Um, so you can be homozygous dominant, which means you have no alleles for sickle cell. You can be heterozygous, which means you carry it and you may have some symptoms, but you don't have the full blown thing. Both of your parents have to have the allele for you to get it which is when you're homozygous recessive. Now, that being said, we have since discovered um, sickle cell anemia is more prominent in African-American communities. Part of the reason they think that is, is because individuals who are carriers for sickle cell anemia, that is they have one allele but not two, are resistant to malaria. Um, if your red blood cells are in that sickle shape, the malaria disease cannot get into your blood. So it's an adaptation to survive malaria, but it also puts you at risk of developing sickle cell anemia. It's like rock in a hard place, which, which is worse. That's a natural selection at work. So we're gonna pretend we have this population somewhere on the map. And we're gonna say that 5% of them are affected by sickle cell anemia. When I say they are affected by sickle cell anemia, I mean that they are dominant or homozygous recessive. So for sickle cell anemia, I hate using letters that don't look the same. I just get confused if I do that. So um, I'm gonna use A, so I'm gonna say, big A, big A, I'm gonna make this big again. So big A, big A, that's gonna be homozygous dominant. You have no sickle cell anemia. Big A, little A, you're a carrier, but what disease do you not get if you're a carrier? Malaria, good, okay. And then we're gonna say, we have this group that is homozygous recessive. 
they have full blown sickle cell anemia. And for that, we're gonna say that is 5%. So that 5%, we're actually gonna turn that into a decimal. We only use decimals when we're using this because remember, everything has to equal to one, as you can see. So I can plug this 0.05 into which data point? P, Q, P squared, 2PQ, or Q squared? Which one could I plug it into? Q squared, very good. So this 0.05 is gonna be my Q squared. I'm gonna write. Q squared, sorry, my marker is dying. It's going to be equal to 0 0.05. Now, if I have Q squared, how would I find, say, Q? I could find Q, but how am I going to find Q using this? Square root. Very good. So I'm going to take the square root of that. Oh, my goodness. Please don't die right now. I need you now. Oh, do I have another one? This is not going to be good. So if I have the square root, so I'm going to take my calculator. You will not use your phone on the test, but you know what I mean. Um, so I'm going to take the square root of 0 0.05. And that's going to give me, I'm going to round it to 0 0.22. So my Q is gonna be zero point, this is really hard to write backwards, y'all, I'm sorry. Zero point two two. Now if I have Q, what can I get next? What can I get next if I have Q? P, very good, Elena. So remember, P, Whoa, backwards. Plus Q is going to be equal to 1. I'm sorry, this is so hard to see. Maybe if I turn this thing off, it'll be a little. Okay, so we've got our P plus Q is equal to 1. We know that P or Q is equal to 0 0.22. So what is the value of P? It's not actually any better, actually. What is the value of P? Sorry, y'all. I was trying to find another dry erase marker and I failed miserably. I don't know where they went. Well, so, so very good. P is going to be 0 0.78 because we're going to take one, one minus 0.22. We're going to get 0.78. Now that we've got that P is 0.78, what can we do next? What number can we find next? What can we find next? P squared. All we've got to do, wake up. I got a new phone case and it's kind of crunchy. All I've got to do is take that 0.78 and I'm going to square it. And that gives me 0 0.6084. So now I've got my P squared. Let me try this for y'all. So I know that Q squared, so I'm going to do, P squared plus 2P Q plus Q squared is equal to 1. 
try it like this. Okay. We know that P squared is going to be the square of 0.78, which is 0 0.06. Zero point six. I'm going to round it to six one. Plus, we don't have two p q, but we do have q squared. What is q squared? What can I plug in for q squared? Tell me. 0.05, very good. And remember, this is all equal to one. How can I find 2PQ? How can I find it? How can I find 2PQ? Point seven eight times point oh five times two. So point oh five is the value of q squared. You've got it, except instead of that point oh five, we need the value of q. Point two two times very good because we can take that plain value of p and q. So I'm going to take that. 0.22 times 0.78 times 2, and that's going to give me 34.32. If I add that up with 0.05 and 0.61, I get 1. That's it. Ah! That's how you do Hardy Weinberg. I will be honest with you guys. This is just one of those that you have to write everything out and plug in the numbers everywhere you go. Um, and the more problems you work, I know this isn't a math class, but you got to do a little stats today. The more problems you work, the more it makes sense. So I strongly recommend Khan Academy has some good resources. Um, if you just Google Hardy Weinberg practice problems, they pop up and they usually come with answer keys so you can check yourself. Um, but it's already at 58 minutes. Oh, my goodness. Um, so I'm about to have to go because it's past my bedtime here. Um, so what questions do you have? You've got me for about two more minutes. How are we feeling? What can I do for you? Hmm. Questions? You're welcome, Elena. Thank you for coming. You're welcome, Sandra. Thank you for coming. Any questions, Ariana? Three, two, one. All right, y'all. I hope I've helped. Like I said, um, check out Khan Academy. Um, we're gonna have study guides out on Hardy Weinberg very soon. I'm pretty confident. So I would be checking for those. I'm sure there will be some practice problems on there. But yeah, if you just Google practice Hardy Weinberg, they pop up. So all right, y'all. Thanks for coming. And I hope you all have a great night. See you soon.